position in classical ballet. I was a dancer, I'm now a critic and historian, and one of my favorite moments in dance, besides the first position, is um, when the curtain rises. We don't have a curtain here, but if you imagine that there's a heavy professional stage curtain weighing several hundred pounds, and when that curtain rises, something extraordinary happens. The vacuum that was sealed between the audience and the stage is broken. And suddenly there's a rush of cold air that comes on the stage. And for the dancers waiting to perform, it's really quite an extraordinary moment because what's happened is that the world of the ordinary, of the everyday, where we all live and where we have all of our cares and all the things we're thinking about, and the world of the stage, the world of the extraordinary, where all of that melts away and it's just music, movement, and feeling. Suddenly, there's a connection between the two. People in the 17th century called the world of the ballet stage, whoops, the marvelous, the merveilleux, the extraordinary, and the supernatural. They thought of it as a place where anything could happen. It was a place where people could fly, where they could appear and, and reappear and disappear or they could apparate in the Harry Potter language. Um, it was a place inhabited by spirits and ghosts, by sylphides and ondines. And it was very close to them because people at the time really believed that, that spirits could enter the lives of men and they could actually change the course of events. Here's a sylphide. This is Marie Taglioni in 1832 in the Ballet of La Sylphide. Some of you may have seen it. It's still performed today in a different version. Um, Marie Taglioni, you can see it's a, it's a, a, a performance of, she, she is um, light and airy. I'm gonna tell you exactly what a sylphide is. A sylphide is made of 100% atoms of pure air. She has no connection to the earth. She's weightless. She lives in the atmosphere. But she's not all light and air. She was also thought at the time to be an erotic creature. She could appear um, at the objects of her desire in the night, although she was perfectly chaste. Look at the costume and the, and the, the design here. Everything conspires to this effect. You have the skirt, which is diaphanous, light, airy the early tutu. You have the toshu. What the toshu does is it means that her connection to the earth is very, very small. That surface area, about the size of a quarter, is the only place that she's touching the earth. The rest is in the air. Now, don't be fooled, because of course, in order to achieve this illusion, you have to have extraordinary strength. And her calves, just underneath that skirt, and her thighs were really big and very developed. That shoe doesn't have the kind of extra support that toe shoes today have, so she's basically standing on, on her own strength on that to create that illusion. Um, I think this is one reason that so many little girls aspire to be a dancer, they dream of tutus, they dream of toe shoes. What do they want? They want to enter this world of the extraordinary. They want to exit the everyday and move into something else. Lest you think it's just women, men also danced in the air. And of course, here the power is in the jump. So they have developed their bodies in order to take flight. This is Marie Taglioni's compatriot, Paul in flight. So a sylphide is pure aspiration. She's the de desire to elevate, to go further, to become airborne. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to dance 
was just like those little girls, I also wanted to enter this other world. I started when I was about eight, and when I was 14, I moved to New York to go to the School of American Ballet, and there I entered, again, another world. This time, it was a Russian world. Many of my teachers were emigres and exiles who had come from Russia. They had been born in the 19th century or in the early years of the 20th century, um, and they looked and sounded and smelled like another, another century. My teacher, I remember Alexandra Danilova, I still remember her coming to class. She would wear, she would look a little bit like this. She would wear a long, sort of diaphanous, pastel-colored skirt, matching leotard, gorgeous scarves. She had heavy makeup, false eyelashes. This is in the 1970s. <laughs> false eyelashes um, and very strong, sweet perfume. Uh, she taught us how to dance, but she was also very concerned with decorum and with sort of taste and how you appear. I remember one day I was running to class. I was sort of tearing down Broadway. I was late. I had a sandwich to one hand. I was wearing my jeans and my T-shirt. And I ran smack into Danilova. And she said to me, she took one look. She said, Jenny, if you want to become a dancer, you're going to have to learn not to dress that way in public. And you're going to have to learn not to eat on the street. Dancers are different from everyday people. If they don't do those things, they must appear differently. Well, I was enough of a child of the 60s that I thought that was kind of ridiculous. <laughs> and um, even more sort of ridiculous and even troubling to me was the very almost military quality of the training and of the whole ballet world. Dancers were not to talk back. Everybody was very obedient. There was no discussion. There was certainly no chance for any kind of uh, democratic <laughs> consideration of, of, of your views. Um, the the co-director of the school, when I was there, used to call it the West Point of ballet. And it did have a real boot camp kind of quality, but it was, it was a boot camp for this, for elevation, for art. Um, so I realized pretty quickly that I had a choice. I could either decide that I was just going to leave all that behind and quit, or I would have to sort of take it on faith and go with it all the way, because I certainly wasn't going to change these Russians. They were very clear about that. Um, so I was interested enough in what they were doing, and I loved to dance. So I took it on faith, and I did become a dancer. But more than that, I really started to believe in ballet. And it became almost like a religion to me. It had a sort of devotional aspect, a worship quality. There were rituals and practices. Every morning, we did our plies. We did a whole class where we organized the body anatomically correct. It felt like a purifying kind of experience. There was community. We did that together, so you always felt you were part of a larger project. Um, and yet, we were also alone, concentrated in our sort of relationship to the art. Um, and at the end, if everything went well, if the music was right, and you felt good, and you were, you were in, in good shape, and nothing hurt too much, because ballet's also really hard, <laughs> Um, if everything came together on stage, there was transcendence, real moment of transcendence. So I danced for a long time, and I loved it. But then one year, I kind of hit a brick wall. And I mean, I was thinking about it before I came here to this day. I'm really not sure exactly what happened. But at first, it was physical. I remember being in rehearsal, and the ballet mistress said, pirouettes from fist, plie, turn. Plie turn. To do that, you have to have a really concentrated energy. And I just couldn't. And my limbs were like, like jelly, and I just couldn't do it. It was as if everything inside me that had been accepting this on faith sort of reared up and said, you know, I just don't want to be that disciplined anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. So I stopped dancing. And I thought this would be not very hard, but in fact, it turned out to be really difficult. Um, I went to school. 
I've had kind of physical withdrawal, depression, sort of identity crisis. I had been a dancer since I was eight. Who was I now? I was in my mid-20s. I had no idea. Um, I ran pretty much as far as I could from ballet. I ran away from the life of the body and the physical things to the life of the mind. I you know, went to school, books, reading. I did a BA, I did an MA, I did a PhD. I just, but I kept on coming back to ballet. I, it wouldn't quite go away. I was still very passionate about it. And so it took a long time, but I finally realized that I could sort of use the tools of the life of the mind in order to understand my obsession with this very physical art form. And so I started to explore the history. And at that point, I really sort of immersed myself, I kind of got lost for about 10 years, in archives, in other centuries. I lived in the 16th century for a while, 17th, 18th. And at each point, you know, sometimes I thought I was crazy because I'd read these sort of obscure dance documents and I'd come out and I'd be all excited about them, but I didn't have anybody to talk to, so I would talk to myself, or I would talk to, you know, I'd be sitting in my study, and my kids would come in, Mommy, who are you talking to? <laughs> I was talking to Taglioni, to the others, trying to understand what had, ha what had happened. One of the places where I spent the most amount of time was at the court of Louis XIV, if I can get him. There he is. This is Louis when he was 15 years old, in 1653, performing the role of Apollo. He loved to perform the role of Apollo, the god of civilization, of harmony, um, with his perfect proportions and beauty. It was an affirmation of his own royal authority. Louis was himself a great dancer. He cared a lot about dancing. He performed in some 40 productions from the time he was 13 when he started dancing until about 18 years later when he retired. Um, and he cared, he, he cared a lot about ballet. It was under his reign that the five positions that I, just, that I began with were first codified and really described. So I want to take you through those a little bit because they're very interesting. Um, this is the first position as we saw earlier. Now, if you, this is a, a, a picture from, from the period which really shows you that ballet was an etiquette before it was an art. It was a way of being, a science, as one ballet master put it, of behavior towards others. It's a noble art. It's a noble, this is a noble image. Look, take the, drop a plumb line from the top of his head, straight down through the body to the feet. Divide the body in half, and you can see that there's a perfect symmetry on either side. There's ease and control. He's got his arms low. People thought at the time that if you raised your arms high or above the shoulders or in any kind of speed, that it was a sign of the, the passions unleashed. And here we were going to contain the passions, control the passions, keep everything in order. There's a sense of ease. His positions are not as forced as the positions today, a little bit more relaxed. And the reason for that was that the idea was that you were noble, that you didn't have to work, and that you shouldn't show your work. So it was a noble etiquette and stance. But I think it's very important to realize that even though it was a noble art form, you didn't have to be noble to do it. And in fact, one of the ideas about ballet was that if you could master these positions, you could actually become more noble. It was not an aristocracy of birth, it was an aristocracy of work. Um, ballet was not only an etiquette, it was also a mathematics. This is the second position. Notice the distance between his feet is exactly the, a foot or the width of the shoulders and hips. This is not second position, this is second position. And they really took the time to measure the proportions of the body and then coordinate the steps accordingly. It was also a map. The second position showed this plane of movement, so you could move this way, all the way along this plane. The third and fourth positions, that's the fourth position, showed this 
plane of movement. You could move forward. You could move back. Not that way. Not that way. Only this way. If you moved that way, you had to know what the angle was that you were moving. So everything was very precise and linear. The fifth position pulls the feet together, plumb line again, all the way up. It's a perfect balance point. Um, ballet was not only an etiquette and a mathematics, it also had religious connotations. People believed that if you could master these positions, you could actually raise yourself up on the great chain of being, the great chain of being which organized all matter from the lowest vegetable life all the way up towards the angels and God. Man, stuck in the middle, pulled down to earth by his physical instincts, by appetites, by sex, by hunger, all of these physical needs pulling him down. If you did danced, you could move up a little bit on the great chain of being towards the angels and God. Not only that, you could actually enter the harmony of the spheres and the natural order of the universe. The patterns of the body would reflect the planetary motions. And the patterns that people created in ballets, that dancers created, which were also very symmetrical and very ornate, would also reflect those patterns. There was an order in the body. People thought that the ankles and the wrists, the knees and the elbows, the hips and the shoulders were related. So that when you moved, if you bent your ankle, it had to show in the wrist. If you bent your knee, it had to register in the elbow. So you had this plane and this plane. And the positions, you can see, there is always a coordination both across the, the north-south divide and across the east-west divide. So ballet was an etiquette. It was a science or mathematics. It had this religious connotation. And it also had a military origin. This is a fencing manual from the 16th century. And you can see there the first position, very clearly marked. If you aspired to noble stature in this period, you studied fencing, riding, and ballet. So it's no surprise that there was a sort of mixing and sharing of both positions and of practices, hence the West Point of ballet, all of those almost military-like lines that you see in ballet. Think of the Corps de Ballet in Swan Lake. All of that comes from these military origins of ballet. So again, Louis. When you stand in these positions, all of that, all of that history is there. And I think dancers today have access to that. They don't quite even know sometimes, you know, if they don't know the history, what, why it means so much. But that's one of the reasons why. Because ballet was never just a set of physical exercises or positions. It was always a set of beliefs, an aspiration to nobility, an aspiration to the extraordinary, to le merveilleux. It was a way of life, and it is today a connection to the past, a direct connection both to Louis and to Marie Taglioni and to the worlds that they lived in. It is a living, moving history. Thank you.